So um, when you think about the, where we are as coaching and where we are in our thinking about coaching, our job is to help people think critically about their lives and what they want to do and the direction they want to take. And so how do we get into that space is what we're going to talk about today. So um, when we have webinars and we have them every um, first Wednesday of the month, and so we have two more coming up and then we'll break for the summer and come back in September. Um, what we're trying to do is think about how to sharpen our saw. This is, we've got folks on this call from all over the world, okay? And the idea is what can we learn from each other? And so this is sharpening our saw and bringing, thinking about yourself, your coach, your organization, and hopefully you walk away with one tool that will help you grow your coaching skills. So today we're gonna to talk about the thinking environment, third generation coaching, compassionate coaching, eclectic coaching, and how we're gonna pull it all together to make sense out of um, what, what we're talking about when we think about thinking critically. So there's a woman in um, the UK named Nancy Klein, and she talks about the 10 thinking components. So what are we doing when we're thinking and we're coaching? The first thing we're doing is we're giving attention to both ourselves and what we're thinking and our clients. So we're in a little bit of reflection when we're in the coaching process. So we're really interested in what the person thinks, what they're saying now, next, we're asking questions. Sometimes as leaders, we get into um, talking to people um, and we know the right way for them. And so we're preparing for what we're going to say to them instead of what we're going to say with them. So how do we stay in that attention to what the person is um, saying and engaging? Um, when I think about this, I think about th that when we think about the best coaching we've ever had, it's somebody that was curious and they were asking questions instead of telling us what we needed to do. And so what I think critical thinking partnerships do in coaching is they empower both people to think deeply and be the best version of themselves. And so there is an, an aspect of equality. We're equals. And for those of you that have taken my coaching classes, you know that when we want to create psychological safety, we want to create equality. If we create equality, then the person is more likely to tell us what they really think. If we create disempowerment because they think we're going to tell them what to do, then we we lack that e equality aspect. Ease. So it's okay. We're not rushing, okay? And when I talk about setting up those coaching moments, that they need to be at least a half an hour, if not an hour, and that you're not looking at your iPhone and you're not thinking about what you need to do next. And you're definitely not thinking about your grocery list. So you know, how do you move out of that sense of urgency and to just be present and be in that moment? Nancy Klein talks about appreciation and how do we appreciate the person and how do we deal with what might be perceived as judgment or criticism? In our program, we teach um, PEA and NEA, and we're going to talk about that today, which is positive emotional attractors and negative emotional attractors. We also teach the difference between judger and learner questions. So how do we ask questions in a way that you're really trying to learn and you're appreciating that's what they think and that's where they are. And we can't move people until we're able to accept them where they are and then move them, okay? Once we know we're accepted, I can think this, then we have a tendency to say, oh, I can move it as well. So she says, five times more than you criticize them. If you look at the work by Barbara Fredrickson and positivity, she says it's at least three to one. And she says for effective teams, it's six to one. So can we, can we acknowledge we have feelings? Can we acknowledge that we're experiencing those thinking, those, those feelings? Again, I'm going to integrate some of the, um, the work that we do at Global ILC with RULER and Mark Brackett, where we recognize and then understand what we are thinking 
um, a feeling rather. And then, then we say, what's the right label for it? When I'm working with clients individually and I ask them to name, quick, name 10 feelings. They get about six. And then they start going, well, 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 and it's hard. And so we're we're accustomed to sadness and anger. We're accustomed to, do we think about joy? Do we think about um, optimism as a feeling? So, you know, helping them to really identify their feelings and then what's really going on. Information. Sometimes clients don't want sometimes your direct reports so most of you that can see from the names are leaders so sometimes people don't want to admit things are really going on and so how do we show respect for we understand how difficult it is to admit for them to be vulnerable and yet help them be vulnerable so that we can use information to take them into their best version of self um, how do we encourage I, I was talking with a leader yesterday that was saying when I encourage someone to, you know, to accept the, where they are, um, am I not encouraging them to make excuses? And I think the reality is they are where they are. Now we can move them instead of seeing it um, as excuse making. Yes, yes. We okay, Kelly. That was so great. I, the same person I was talking to was talking about her own vulnerability and how she was sharing that in her coaching. And was that okay? Of course it's okay. We want, we have to be vulnerable in order for other people to be willing to share their vulnerabilities. Diversity, people think differently. When we get into third generation coaching, we're going to talk about meaning making. We all make meaning differently. Diversity, um, we just talked about incisive questions. So what are you curious about? It's really interesting when we start um, when we start the coaching program, particularly at the core level, we give 500 questions that you can ask, okay? But you know what I want to know? I want to know what you're curious about. Yes, those questions get us started. You know, one of my favorite is what's the most important thing for us to talk about today? Okay, what's on your agenda? What do you want to make sure we don't miss today that's really important to you? I have an agenda, but... What, what's going on for you that we really have to address? And so those questions start, but then what, you know, what we're going to talk about today in third generation coaching is what is the next step in that? So in my, co in my core class, people ask me the best question to ask. And I say, it's the fifth question. Kathy, remember what the fifth question is? Yeah, it's the fifth question because we can't script coaching especially not at the third generation level, it's, it's additive. So, you know, that fifth question finally gets to the core of what's going on for the person, but it's incisive. It's like, okay, what's really happening here? What am I thinking? And the place where we can think together. So is the place supportive of us having the coaching conversation that we're going to engage in? Any questions on the 10 thinking components? I have more information on it if anybody's interested in that. Okay, if you're not, I get to go on. Okay, so now, why are we even talking about their generation coaching? It's because everything's changing, okay? The rules and regulations and the structure we used to follow, we're making it up day to day. For those of you that have done DISC with me, you know we live in, an, um, they have a high S, you know we live in a VUCA environment. It's volatile, it's uncertain, it's complex, it's ambiguous. Many of you are in financial services. That is game changing all the time. You know, when we have issues with um, a resurgence of the flu or a resurgence of COVID, we don't know who's coming to work. We don't know how we're going to staff. So we're still, we're still in a making it up. And it's really interesting. Um, I do a lot of DISC, as you, as you know, and I've probably done three or 400 assessment since I've been back from the UK when the pandemic started and everybody's S goes down because we're all coping with the uncertainty. Well, if we're not certain, how are we going to coach like we're certain? So we're still trying to figure out what's going on, not only with the individual, but within the organization and with society because we're coaching people within those three dynamics. So coaching helps leaders navigate because we find information out and we help people grow, stretch and grow. 
We find out what they value because that is what's going to drive behavior. What somebody values is what, dri is what drives behavior. So we want to check in on all those values. We want to be able to be reflective. What's going on here? Trying to understand requires reflection in leadership um, that, that we offer space for self-reflection. One of my colleagues, when I was at um, the firm I was at, we had a master's program that graduated at Middlesex University in the UK. And he did his master's project on reflection after coaching, the client reflecting with the direct report reflecting after coaching. And I would say at least 80% of the people he interviewed asked him to define what reflection is. We don't spend a lot of time in reflection. We spend a lot of time in action. So how do we integrate reflection into our coaching practice and help our directs build it into their uh, way of being as well? It's hyper complex. There's no way we're gonna get away from it. So how do we build that into how we coach and how do, how do we take action? And then self-reflection is very much part of um, the third generation coaching. So when we think about the generations, the first generation was very much re uh, rooted in sports psychology. So we stood on the sidelines and we told people what to do, okay? That works well in sport. It still works well in sport, but it doesn't work well in helping a person empower themselves because they're gonna do things our way, not their way, and they're not gonna remember how to do it because they're still trying to figure out how to do it your way. So we moved then to second generation where we said, okay, um, there's a solution that needs to be found. So we get into solution-based coaching. So, hey, what's the problem? What's the solution? Go do it. Again, many times the solution that we came up with was something that fit the organization or fit the leader. So how do we now move as leaders into third generation, which is, that we're focusing on values and identity, that we're co-creating with them, that we're generating meaning through understanding what is being said, that it's collaborative. I'm helping you step into the best version of yourself as you're looking at what's the best version of yourself. And it's rooted in transformative, empowering dialogues. And when I'm saying third generation, I want to make sure that you understand that I'm talking about coaching within an organizational construct, okay? I'm not talking about just individual development. Um, what, it, what are the goals of the organization? So when I'm building organizational coaching cultures, I'm saying they do three things. They close knowing, doing gaps. They enhance performance and they align behaviors with the objectives of the organization. So when I'm saying third generation, it's less goal, or goal oriented. It is goal oriented, but it's based on developing the person within the confines of the organization. Any questions on that? Does that not make sense? Um, I love it. To, do you have specific questions to challenge a sense of ego based on past performance? Okay. So Kelly, you're spot on and I do have it. So I, I'm the kind of facilitator that says, there's a question, let's talk about it, okay? So when I hear ego, Kelly, I hear fear, okay? So part of it is getting to the fear of what's really going on with the person. So when somebody's in denial about performance and I ask them, okay, so how would you rate your performance today? Or how would you rate your performance last year? You know, what were the best things that happened? So you start trying to surface from them what they think they do well. And so um, when even when somebody gives us a 10 and most people don't, most people, when you say, you know, after that meeting, how would you rank yourself on a scale of one to five or one to 10? Most people are going to say, well, it's an eight. You know, a lot of times when I get off presentations, I go, well, that was a B. That was a B plus because I'm reflecting on what I could do differently. So when they give themselves a 10 and they say, I'm doing everything I need to do, then I come back with the 1% better question, which comes from Atomic Habits. And we're talking about what would 1%, okay, we all can get better. You're giving yourself a 10. 
But as everybody gets better, then you'll start coming down in ranking. So what would 1% better look like for you for the next meeting? So we, when people give themselves a 10 and we know they're not a 10, the first thing we feel, Kelly, is, is to help them you know, get into their denial. That's not going to work. We have to take them from where they are to the next, the next level. So if you could change one thing about your year last year, if you could change one thing about that meeting, what would you change? So even though they're giving themselves a 10, you're going with it and they're in their ego because they're afraid to admit they aren't all that. So then we pull them back and we ask questions around it that we're allowing them to live there, but also asking them to move forward 1%. Does that make sense? Anybody have questions on that? Okay. So uh, yeah, there's a question. Let's go. Um, okay, good, Kelly. So the thing about focusing on meaning making, for those of you that were um, in my Drawn to Drama workshop last month, meaning making and how people are making meaning is going to determine their action. Because from the meaning they make, they create um, a story. Part of that story is the emotions they feel. So we want to bring people's way of making meaning and reflection back to what do they value and where, they, where do they want to go with that, with that value. So we're building reflection, collaborative coaching, collaborative interactions into third generation um, uh, programs. And we're experiencing each other as fellow humans, okay? I'm really about empowerment. And it's not power over, it's not power under, it's power with. How do we establish power with those folks that we coach? So first of all, what do they value? And so there's a group, uh, well, we do values assessments, but we also have you know, if you go out, I think it's called the Value Center, spelled the English way, C-E-N-T-R-E, -E, where you can go out and identify your values. I've done that a number of times just to kind of check in and see where I am. I know my values as it goes to the values assessment and what drive me. But, you know, is there something else I could noodle on? So we can ask our directs to fill out a values assessment. And that assessment is free to think about where are you? Um, you can also ask them to reflect and bring values to your uh, coaching conversation. So um, what they value is what they value. And I think sometimes we get sideways as coaches because we think we can make people value something they do not. OK, so um, and that kind of comes into organizational performance. So you have to dig in to find what really makes them sing, what really makes them tick. I was talking with a client this week that has um, a person who's a project manager. And so the thing that, the, that his direct loves is the relationship part of the project management and not so much the actual structure of project management. He's like, well, how do I get there? Well, you get there by really helping that person see that the structure of project helps others. So we start bringing the value connection back. It doesn't mean that that person doesn't value structure, but she, she uh, values relationships first. But when she understands the structure of the project helps others and she values relating to others, now you bring the connection together, okay? We create opportunities for meaning making. How do you make meaning from what you're talking about? What is the meaning you're making? Um, as if you were there last month, we talked about global meaning and situational meaning. And global meaning talks about the culture, the organization, what we've grown up in. And then we talk about those individual experiences that map back up to the meaning they're making. Um, and for those of you that are have sales teams you've worked with, you know, what is the meaning you make for success of your team? What is the meaning you make for your individual success? What does that mean to you? So we start talking about meaning making. And then it's a, it's a narrative collaborative process. And that is we are responsive. We're in tune with each other. We have a witness, which is the art of being with the other. And then of course we have conversational ethics, okay? Are we careful with the conversation we're having and how do we hold space for that conversational ethics? Um, so, I'm going to put you in breakout because you're done listening to me for the first 
25 minutes. I'm going to give you about eight minutes in your breakout, and you're going to talk about what are the elements of Nancy Klein's 10 thinking components show up in your coaching? So you don't have access to them, but think about how you um, bring thinking into your coaching conversations right now and how you might like to expand upon that. And when you think about third generation coaching, think values, what do people value? What is the meaning they make from the value? And then how do you co-create together when you're coaching others. So think about that as you go into your breakouts. Um, I love it when it takes the whole time to bring you all back, okay? That means you had fabulous conversations. So what did you talk about with regards to how you think with your clients as well as what you might do differently to expand on it? Who wants to share? I can see your names, by the way. I can share, Dr. Peggy. <laughs> Bring it. So I had Kelly with me in our group. And of course, we started talking about um, a big part of the ego because we find that, you know, oftentimes we do have those big egos in our teams. And especially it's our high achievers for the most part, like the high achievers that we have to kind of bring out the vulnerability, which should be a big challenge. Um, but then it's also like we connected it to Nancy Klein's, like the thinking environment. How are we putting together? Like, how are we creating that environment in order to, you know, maybe make those big egos more vulnerable and maybe help them see like, okay, great. You are, you know, you're a high achiever. Who are you bringing along with you? How are you bringing them along? How are you impacting this team? Like being able to maybe explore that with them a little bit more. Um, I think for sure that's going to be like a takeaway that we can try to intentionally focus on. And then of course, when we're, you know, as leaders having one-on-ones and having coaching conversations, like not going immediately to problem solver. I, I love know that. that's what we do. Awesome. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Who else wants to share? I love what you're saying about ego because I want you to keep in the back of your mind, when you hear ego, you hear defense. Somebody's feeling like they need to defend something and keep it back from you. So how can you help them be a little more vulnerable with a little piece of it? Okay. Well, well we were looking at uh, value-based, right? How do we get to what they value and figure that out to help them open up and become vulnerable because we don't want to assume that they value the same things that we do. That makes sense. Correct. And they don't because values are created from the meaning as well. Okay. Who else wants to share? I'll I'll you, oh. uh, go ahead. No, Rob, go ahead. Good. No, I was just going to say, you know, Matt and I were talking about it. And, and you know, I think the one thing that we see here that's a, a common across the board, it's, it's that level of respect. Um, you, you have to respect each other. They have to respect you. Um, and then understand why you're delivering this information and understand the position that they put you in to have this conversation, whether it's positive or negative. I mean, you know, you know here's... If I'm giving you something on a project that you did to make you feel better, uh, then I'm going to tell you my opinion and they have to respect your opinion and know that you're doing it for the better good. If it's something that they've done wrong and you're having to come to them and have a tough, uncomfortable conversation, they have to respect you as, as, as a friend, a leader or, or a coach and say, you know, I understand where you're coming from, you know, you know, and, and letting them know that they put you in the position to have to do this. You didn't just come on and do that. So, so thanks Matt for sharing that with us. Man. Yeah. And also not, not to question, question the intent, right? Yeah. I think that's also important, you know, separating the intent from what's happening and, uh, you know, and Rob was talking about how we need to make sure that that's clear that, you know, what we, what we are coaching on is not, it's just the action, is the performance, not the person, you know? A hundred percent. I love that you added that. And feel free to use what I believe coaching does within an organizational context. Enhances performance, closes knowing doing gaps, and aligns with organizational objectives. So if something that was done is not in alignment with one of those three spaces, then you talk about it from that space. And it's the behavior, not the person. I love that. Kathy. Yeah. And one, one additional thing, as I was talking and we, you know, we learned this in like crucial conversations, it's like people don't shut down based on like the message, but the intent with 
why you're kind of bringing up that message. So I think the intent, it's like if they think, you know, if they have the wrong um, idea of what your intent is, then then that's where maybe conversations kind of break down. So it's just that that's so important, Matt, that you brought that up too, because um, your intent is to either align like to what people value or your intent is to like help them succeed so whatever you know whatever their your intent is it needs to be positive and it needs to be made clear um the other thing too and 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 I'm like so guilty of this and I I should know better it's just that attention piece the first of like the 10 thinking components because we're all just sort of like jumping from one meeting to another and like are you taking the time before the meeting to be the most prepared? Are you using that question? Like you said, Peggy, like if today, what, you know, if this time was successful or like what's most important to you that you, that we don't want to miss. Um, and then like not multitasking when you're having that conversation or not checking that email. So like just removing the distractions so that you can be present for your, for your direct is again, so critical. And sometimes I kind of I'm guilty of getting distracted, which again, being vulnerable here. <laughs> We're all there, Kathy. And I love that now that I'm coaching um, more virtually than ever, obviously. And now that teams has become such a, a important infrastructure in organizations, I see when people see the team thing pop up, you know, they're talking to me and they're like, their eyes are going over here. <laughs> I know that's because something in teams popped up and you're feeling if I don't do something with that, I'm going to, you know, somebody's going to be mad at me or, you know, I, I need to be, you know, responsive and do it right now. And I think we've gotten a neck. And that's why I say if we can move away from our desk, if we can move away from our offices, we don't see those teams and, and those other things that pop up. And now we're all wearing watches and, you know, constant pop up information. So really good points. Anything else you want to add? I'd like to add something. Yeah. Um, so when Charlie and I were talking, we talked about attention too, as Kathy was saying, is how difficult it is to have that, um, but not to, to not go in with your agenda and what you want to talk about and what you want to make sure it gets uh, the point that you want to make. Um, but beyond that is, you know, when you, let's say you, you eliminate all of that and you have full attention, but as soon as it's over, you're back out. We don't take that purposeful time to reflect. Yeah, uh, we're not reflecting. Do we give the team member time to reflect? And how do we know that we're doing it properly? Right? Yeah. We can say, oh, well, this went well, but did it? We think it did, but did it go well? Do they think it went well? So how do we do that purposefully? And how do we make sure that that team member um, got out of this interaction, what we hope that they did? So Angel, can you integrate that in as a wrap up, you know? What's your takeaway from today? That's that's one of my favorite questions when I'm teaching. What's your one takeaway? Okay. Mm -hmm. And some of you even started telling that already. <laughs> what I'm taking away from today. And you haven't heard the last two um, pieces of it. So, so you know, it, and, and then knowing I'm always going to ask for a takeaway has been come, has become standard way of interacting with one another. So you can build that in. Okay. Any, anything else for the cause? Okay, we're going to go back now to compassionate coaching. And compassionate coaching comes from an idea. This comes from Richard Boyatzis. So I'm going to be using some of intended change theory, which I promised Kathy when she got on the call, um, to talk a little bit about intended change theory as a way of talking about what is important and what is valued. But what is compassionate coaching? Um, the fact that we can be empathetic and understanding. So I don't have it included here, but it's in my blog on compassionate coaching. If you want a really good experience, Brene Brown has a YouTube uh, uh, presentation on the difference between empathy and sympathy. And it is really, really good and a bit funny. There's some funny parts to it. Um, I love her anyway for her sense of humor, but Empathy is, you know, being um, able to, to demonstrate care and concern for the experience they're having without having it with them, okay? How do we keep judgment out? Judgment is so hard 
when we're leading because we know that that behavior can come back on us. So how do we not judge it, but talk about, you know, what's a better action? It's not good or bad, but what would be better? That we have positive regard and respect for the person we're working with. We're building collaboration in third generation coaching. As you see, we're integrating different ways of looking at what we're looking at. We got to focus on the whole person and their well-being, okay? Where are they physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, which is passion and purpose? Um, so where are they with their well-being? Are we talking about where their strengths are? Are we trying to expand them into their weaknesses? Those of you that do strengths finders in your organizations know you can't build, you really build upon weaknesses. You manage weaknesses. How do we build on strengths? How do we encourage and create self-compassion for ourselves? Okay, that reflection um, that we do after coaching. How do we have compassion for we did the best we can? Um, many of you that know me say, I'm always saying gestalt. It's a gestalt world. We do the very best we can in the moment. And then we get a little better next time. And maybe you did better before, but you, this is where you were today. Um, create a nurturing, empowering environment. So again, nurturing, empowering, explore, grow, stretch. And what is that connection? Do people trust us to tell us um, what's really going on? And are they vulnerable with us? So those of you who know me, and there are a few of you that are new to this call, you're going to hear me talk about PEA and NEA. I had a client tell me this week that she was struggling with her partner. And he, when she told him that the words bothered her, he said, they're just words, get over it. And I was like, really? Because I have evidence that proves that's not true. So my evidence comes from Dr. Boyatzis at um, Case Western Reserve, who has worked with another um, researcher, uh, Jack, um, who had run MRIs on individuals when they were describing situations in which were negative and which were positive. And they, they were putting them in that category based on what they were saying, not necessarily give me a negative um, situation. But I guarantee you, if I asked you right now to give, your, to give me a negative situation and describe it in depth, your heart rate would go up because that's what happens. We have sympathetic, ways of responding in our nerv nervous system and we have parasympathetic when we're in sympathetic which is the right side of the slide we start our, our adrenaline kicks in cortisol kicks in and we go into fight flight or freeze i personally when i am criticized i feel myself pull in i feel myself shut down and so kathy made a really good point of we don't know what somebody is interpreting as criticism. And that is why we have to be so careful with the language we use so we're on the positive emotional side or the parasympathetic side. On that side, we're open to ideas, we're like excited, what's the dream? Okay, if we get to the end of this year and you rock your goal out, what's gonna be different? And how are you gonna make that happen? And how are you gonna stay vigilant on it? And what are those milestones that you wanna that you want to focus on. That's all holding them accountable from a very positive way of what's going to be amazing this year. And that's not being a Pollyanna because we are in control of the direction of the dream that we go in for our dreams and how we hit obstacles and how we overcome them. But it's we're excited about it. It's We're excited about trying. This comes a little bit from appreciative inquiry that says everybody has a dream. I think we do, if we can be vulnerable enough to show that dream. But we want to use language that keeps people from shutting down. The minute they shut down, they're not gonna tell us what's going on. Um, okay, so I like that. Kelly, that's a good question. A Socratic method of teaching aligned with this approach. Okay, so you know we're asking you know positively about their values. You know, how do you make that work for you? What does it look like when you're really successful with that value? So we use words that talk about um, the practices that they're already engaging in. You know, what, what do you think really helped you achieve your year last year? What do you think got in the way? Again, a little bit of, of uh, what we're going to talk about with Boyatzis from an intended change. So what we want to be careful of, Kelly, is to make sure 
there's not a layer of judgment in. We got to go back to um, the work on change your change your language, change your thinking. Uh, Marilee Adams in Learner Judge Your Questions is to talk about, you know, why did you do that? Or, you know, what were you thinking when you did that is just going to shut people down. So help me understand, you know, why you choose that approach over another approach and how does it work for you? And that you're really curious, you really want to know um, when we're in this space. So Socratic questioning is great. We have to think about how to use it in a way to expand thinking, to expand empowerment, and to stay more on that positive emotional side, because we know the evidence says when we talk from a negative space, we know where it goes um, in the nervous system of the individual. So words do matter. And I think it's really important that we pay attention to it. So what I love is, is this uh, slide. And again, these, this, this is recorded and you can go back and look at it. When people have self-efficacy, when they have optimism, when they have hope, and that's going into the ideal self, when they're aligning with what are you passionate about? What do you think your calling or your purpose is? What's that desired future that we start thinking about? What's the big dream? What's the big dream for this year? You know, one of the things that we had in my former organization was team-based selling. And what we start when we brought a team together and asked them, you know, what they what, what they were going to do with that extra, extra incentive for the team to work together. And they started talking about the dream that they were building onto their house, that they were putting a daughter in medical school. I was overwhelmed. And there were tears in the room about what we were going to accomplish together. And so allowing yourself to dream of what it could be. If I could do one thing different, what would that look like? How does that align with my values? What's my, you know, and then aligning with my, my core identity. And I put this out here because when we're doing intended change, that's exactly what we're doing. We're starting with who's your ideal self? Who do you want to be? What do I want out of life and work? Okay. So I say the easy way to, to, to characterize this is, where do you want to go? Where are you now? So what's really happening now? Where do you want to go this year? What's really happening now? What's going to take you there is your strengths. What's going to get in your way would be your gaps. And then what's the learning agenda that you're building to learn more about the direction you want to go? And then experiment with it, practice those new behaviors. And then what do those relationships look like that are going to support you? So when I'm working in organizations, and I know Mariana and Angel and Kyle can attest to this, we just do four, five questions, okay? Okay, when we look at the year coming up, you know, what do you want for yourself? Okay, where do you want to go? If we're having a conversation at the end of the year, what's going to be different for you? What's going to lead to your success? What, what is going to make you happy? Okay, what brings you joy? Those kinds of things at work. Why do you do this work? And so for many of you on the call, because I know your businesses, I'm like, what's your noble purpose as an organization? You all have that. So what's the noble purpose here and how do I align? And then, okay, where am I now? Okay, so yeah, that, that's a little NEA. So we go PEA, a little NEA. What's going to help me? And then what's going to get in my way? Again, PEA, NEA. If I am wildly successful this year, what am I going to do differently? And if I miss the mark, what will get in my way? Everybody knows what what's going to get in the way for the most part. We know those bad habits of things that distract us and what's going to get in our way. Okay, the learning agenda is the action plan. What are the actions I'm going to take? So now we've, we're compassionately coaching people by helping them think about what they value, what drives them, what's important, and are they living into that or not? Questions on that? Okay, so now, so it's really interesting. I had this, this thought that came into my mind this morning when I was meditating. And um, I'm gonna say this now, and then I'm gonna really think about it over the next couple of days and how that, sh that shifted in. The purest must guard against righteousness, okay? 
And so when we get so dug into the right model, the right process, the right philosophy, we are becoming purists and it has to be this one right way, okay? But managed eclectic says we can step back, integrate models, integrate process, integrate theory, and then enable the people we're working with based on tools and resources that we've collected. So those of you that, are, that have taken my advanced class, or even this has been pretty much true for our core, is that we send a lot of tools out. Here's an idea, here's a question, here's a tool, here's a resource. And so there is a model we're moving people through. You know, in intended change is a model, but how Kathy does intended change and how Mariana does in intended change in your organization is gonna be different, but it is a model, we integrate models, processes, philosophies, and we get to the managed eclectic. And what I love about it is the questions we ask. Are we both re relaxed enough to allow the issue and the solution to emerge whatever it does? Do I apply any techniques or processes at all? Of course I do. So when we look at the liberated coach, which is a clutterbuck idea that, and he has the, the model that, that, that chart that I just talked about, when we're liberated, we don't place great importance on understanding a technique, model, or process in terms of its or origins, but we think about philosophically, where did that come from, and does that fit with where I am going? Do we use experimentation and reflection to identify whether that new technique, model, or process fits into what I'm trying to accomplish? Do I judge or explore new techniques, models, and processes on the, on the criteria of will this help me be more effective as a coach? And is it what the client needs? And do I use peers and supervisors to challenge their philosophy as partners in experimenting with new approaches? And I, I thought about this because we were talking about vertical development and we we're gonna integrate it in here. And my colleague and I, came to the thing that it was too theory based and it wasn't allowing for you know the person to be the best version of themselves because we were putting them in boxes so how do we refrain from putting our clients and our direct reports in um in a box okay that is basically what eclectic coaching is you don't know what's going to show up so you can go with the fourth question because you trust yourself to have the tools and resources needed to bring the conversation back or to expand the conversation to where the person is going. So we're gonna close with what does reflection in action, you already talked about this, and what does reflection on action look like? Reflection in action is the action you, um, do, you do while you are talking, while you are thinking about Oh, did that question land or, you know, I'm looking at their reaction. It doesn't seem like they really understood. And so you're reflecting as you're coaching. And then the reflection on action is what you do afterwards. And so Angel brought up a really good question. You know, when we get done coaching, we go to the next thing that we have to do. So how do we take a moment, look at our notes and think about what did I really like about this coaching session? What am I happy with? What would I change? So when we talk about building for reflection in action is you're paying attention. The attention is there. What am I missing in the moment? What's going through my mind? What, did, what is my line of inquiry? Why am I asking this question? Am I noticing a pattern? For those of you that are working with me right now, you know, I say everything's a pattern, okay? There's some pattern that's going on for a person that's repetitive, okay? If distraction is a pattern, how do I help my, my directs get out of that distraction pattern? Um, how does this interaction make me feel? Am I happy with my coaching? Am I happy with what's happening between us? How does this make me feel? And what are the emotions, beliefs, or assumptions that I'm experiencing that are impacting my coaching? That's happening while we're coaching. Then we have on action. What worked today? What, what grade would I give myself for that coaching session? How would I make it 1% better? What was not as effective? What does not effective mean in what I'm talking about? So I say coaches are, are given unlimited do-overs. So if you feel like your 
coaching session didn't hit the mark, you can start the next session with, hey, I don't think the, the session really hit the mark. So let's go back to how it ended. And I want to make sure we're both on the same page. Um, yeah, of course, we're going to allow outside observers. Um, sorry. Um, but, you know, it, but I think that um, it, you want to make sure, Kelly, the outside observer understands the context and what's going on. Okay. So as you know, um, for, uh, in the work that you did with Kathy, Matt, and Melissa, we did ask you what was going on. How was that happening? Um, but that, but we can always use peers and and uh, folks that we work with to give us some insights. I I touch base with all my faculty and ask them about things that I'm thinking about. And I even do it in some classes. So what do my responses to the questions reveal about any thinking I have, hypotheses I hold about the direct report? Um, what could have I done differently? And what would I do to change the conversation? And what will I do differently next time? So questions. There's supposed to be a big slide here that says questions and I forgot it. But when you think about the conversation we just had, what questions have come up for you? Do you have any questions? This is your time to play stump the coach. This is your this is your moment. I, I Dr. Bay, I, I don't think that anybody does coaching with um in any one of their their staff or, or or cohorts and ever really doesn't play it back in their head ever. Uh, you know, I do a Monday morning call, I do a team coaching, I do a getting better together. And every time I'm done with any one of those meetings, I think we all do that. We come back and go, you know, I think if you're any type of coach or leader, you've got to come back to yourself and say, what did I do right? What did I do that was good, but not great? And what could I have done differently? And I, I think that what you only call it out of coaching, whatever you call it. I think, I think, I think that every good coach does that. I mean, every athlete does it. I think everybody does that. You know, I fly the plane. I'm a pilot. I fly the plane. I come back and go, what did I do right? What could I have done better? What could I have been more efficient at, you know, time-wise, et cetera. So I, I think that's part of what everybody kind of does in, in retrospect, don't you think? A hundred percent. I love that you're saying that, okay? Because in some ways I am speaking to the choir, but Rob, what we know about top performers is they do that. So as you do that with your coaching, then your directs will do that with their selling, okay? So they will analyze what went well, what didn't work. So as reflection becomes embedded in all of the behaviors in the organization, then people do it as a natural way of being with their behaviors instead of, you know, berating themselves. Okay, you know, they, you know I really have compassion for people that get done with a sales call and then beat themselves up. What we want them to do is think about what one thing could I do differently that would, would, would make me more successful next time? We don't want them to go, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, because again, shutting down. But you know, to think about, focus on the one thing, um, but be reflective. So yeah, really good share. Anything else you wanna add? I mean, I'm with Rob, it's, it's that Monday morning playback, right? That you always do in your head, you know, to recycle what was said. But I always wonder how I could be more effective and I wonder how I could get more, you know, um, honest feedback on what resonated and what didn't. Because to your point with DISC, everyone's different. So it's like some aspects are going to resonate with some performers and some are not going to resonate as intended, right? So it's more of like a, okay, I know these five people are going to get it. These five people are going to walk away with a totally different message. How do I make sure that they follow up the same way that I get the same result from those five people. Right. So it's, yeah, it's that's really why I was asking Kelly, about having someone else sit in, you know? Yeah. Well, Kelly, it's really about asking them to explain back to you what they thought they heard. Right. Yeah. Cause that's how we then we paraphrase and we clean it up a little bit. So yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. Angel. Sorry, I don't want to take angels time. Yeah. So. No, it's okay. Angel. It's okay. Um, so thank you for that. I, um, 
I wanted to ask you because I'm I'm diving into that with the team. I my goal this year with um, my team is to create a, a vision statement for our our team personally. So um, I want to start with talking about values. So I'm not sure where to begin with that. I have you know read Brene Brown and going into her website and how she helps you choose you know top three things like that. Um, just to try to help the team because we are service based and it's a lot of empathy and compassion and care is what we do every day. And it's, it is draining and emotionally draining. And if it's not in you or it's not a value, it's going to be really hard for or impossible to meet our expectations, our performance expectations. So I want to be able to bring up, you know, the team to those that it is in them. It is part of the value system. Maybe they just don't know it yet. This is why you're here, why you decided to come to work here. And then also help others who maybe this isn't for you. This and this is why it's so difficult for you because it doesn't align with your values, is with what we do. So where do I begin? <laughs> so you start with the with the core values of the organization. You start with your serve values, and you start mm -hmm. by saying these are our serve values. Okay, tell me how they show up for you when you are at work and what that looks like. Okay. So you start with the organizational values, then you then you can go to, okay, when you think about your values and you give them time to think about it because most people are reflective and then active in, in your organization. So, you know, send the exercise out a week ahead so they get to think about what do I really value? What's really most important? What do I think the values have been in my life all along? What are some new values I'd like to integrate? Um, if you want to, Angel, you can go out to that values assessment at valuecenter.com -E and ask them to, to examine their values based on that. It's a, it's a really neat little tool. Um, and then start thinking about, are my values, uh, are my behaviors aligning with what I value? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, you know, building that into the conversations you have with the team. And what does that look like? So... Thank you. Okay, I know I went over and some of you are waiting for lunch. Okay, so just a quick oversight. Um, and some people are waiting for dinner. Sorry, Marilena. Um, so, you know, next week we're going to, or next month we're talking about building a coaching culture. And that's with, with one of my clients that built the culture in their organization. And what does it look like? And what have been some of the pitfalls and what are the success stories? And then we have Annie coming to talk about how do you research your own practice? Um, what does it look like? So more reflection, you know, thinking about what do we know? How do we match it to evidence? Hey, always go to Global ILC. The blogs out there, the past webinars, some thought leadership, some events that are coming up. We've built um, coaching essentials into six different components. You can take them individually. If you know anybody that's looking to become a coach, you can go individually through those. And we've got disc values training coming up sometime in April. We're still working on a date because I'm using it in an organization, but opening up to everybody. So stay tuned, come join us for more. Always, always feel free to reach out um, if you have any questions um, or comments or you have any needs um, from anybody at Global IC. And thank you so much for joining us today.